Thank you. Um, great pleasure to chair this panel. Uh, indeed, uh, remarkable achievements, impressive. I think that's, that's true, that's true. Um, I, for me, what really was, uh, there have been major changes in recent years. Uh, as Mario was explaining, uh, I call it tracing the money. Uh, when we came with the Teltro, you know, funding for lending, wanted to go where the money was going and uh, having access to uh, data from individual banks, anonymized, you know, under strict conditions, was one of the key uh, information input that we had to see, you know, is it, does it work or not work? And uh, so this is one little example about many others. And uh, I, I was very proud because I remember uh, when you asked me uh, to defend the case in the governing council some years ago that it would be useful. And we didn't know at that time that we went enter that sort of uh, instrument of monetary policy. So when the decision came much later, we had some of the information tools to see a little bit what happens with the money uh, we lend to the banks. I see some other colleagues here, uh, Bjorn and, and others here, who were behind uh, that, that project here. So uh, great pleasure to have this uh, first session chair. Uh, it's a data needs, so we look at the future and monetary policy. Uh, we will start with uh, Jan. Jan Smet, Governor of the Central Bank of uh, Belgium, National Bank of Belgium. Jan, uh, we will follow uh, in the order here with uh, Pablo Garcia, Executive Board Member of Central Bank of Chile. Also quite a name also in uh, economics, but also in statistics in particular. And then uh, Ewald uh, Novotny, Central Bank of Austria. And then our discussant is uh, Paul Mortimer Lee, obviously not <laughs> present now, uh, according to the program, Natasha. Thank you very much, Natasha. Natasha just joined the, the Central Bank as a Deputy Director General Monetary Policy. So uh, thank you, Natasha. And uh, I didn't force Natasha to come here. You uh, did it with pleasure, so thank you. Um, uh, Paul Mortimerly is, is sick, really. He has a good excuse, and uh, it's not too bad, I, I heard. Uh, but he really couldn't make it. So, uh, so that's, uh, Jan, maybe you, you start now. And uh, it's about 10 minutes, I think, presentations. We have PowerPoint presentation. And then we will open the discussion. Uh, well, looks like, yeah. Uh. Is it? Okay. It, it's okay. It's okay. Um, no, dear Peter, uh, dear friends, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, conference um, and especially this uh, particular session as um, uh, it's about interactions between statistics and the future of monetary policy and we know that this is a hotly debated topic. Um, I must... I, you will agree, let's see, yeah. You will agree that uh, some important and uh, probably interrelated things uh, have been happening over the last decade or so in the monetary policy landscape. Uh, not only have central banks uh, broadened their toolkit to tackle the financial crisis, but also the economic world has been faced with structural changes. And besides both the use of new instruments and the availability of new data, have spurred advances in monetary policy research. Now, the interplay of these uh, phenomena could potentially have, I think, serious implications for the way we think about monetary policy going forward, be it in terms of objectives, instruments, transmission channels, or data monitoring. But, and that is, uh, so to speak, the message I want to convey here to avoid drawing overly hasty conclusions I think this requires careful, careful reflection and, in some cases, implies, indeed, new data needs. Only after careful investigation of the issues at stake and lessons for the future of monetary policy be drawn. And in my remarks today, I will focus more specifically, as you see, on three phenomena that challenge our traditional thinking on monetary policy. First, um, the role played by heterogeneity, which has been uh, clearly demonstrated by the use of new monetary policy tools, eh, typically, indeed, as the president alluded to, more targeted, and something which is increasingly 
increasingly documented in economic research and data. Second, digitalization, uh, probably one of the most notable structural economic changes over the last few years, which also opens the door to a new world of big data. And third, the changing world of the financial sector. Uh, I attempt to raise um, a number of questions to foster the debate and hopefully help to structure our thinking. Uh, how exactly have these uh, challenges called into question the consensus on which monetary policy has been based? How can new data help to identify whether and to what extent the practice of monetary policy has changed? And more speculatively, can new data shape a possible new normal for monetary policy? And needless to say, I do not want to provide any definite answers to these key questions. They have far-reaching implications, making it unrealistic, I think, to settle all this on this panel. But before uh, looking ahead, uh, let's uh, first look back a bit. Um, data that um, central banks traditionally look at are broadly tailored to the new Keynesian model paradigm in, um, with a view of the world, and I'm grossly oversimplifying here, not doing justice to macro modelers nor to policymakers. Um, the central bank um, operates in a framework where representative agents interact, where production is uh, labor intensive and where the role for financial factors is limited. Building on rational expectations and sticky prices, inflation is driven by expected inflation and the anticipated change in real marginal costs, the so-called New Keynesian Phillips curve, which links economic activity and inflation. And in this setup, uh, monetary policy should aim for price stability. And doing so requires bringing aggregate demand in, into line with the potential output path. And the prime way to do so in these models is by steering individuals' intertemporal choice between consuming today versus tomorrow. And this gives a key role to interest rates, where the working assumption is that the central bank steers perfectly the interest rate that is relevant for the representative agent. The careful monitoring of macroeconomic aggregates and their projections successfully supported monetary policy decisions in this view of the world, in which, which seemed, uh, I would say, fairly appropriate until oh, up to about 10 years ago. But like I hinted in uh, my uh, introduction, several developments might have called into question this fairly simple framework. So let me indeed focus on the three challenges to the standard practice of monetary policy and their data dimension that I just mentioned. And the first one, as I said, is um, heterogeneous agent, agents. The um, appropriateness of representative agent models has been challenged quite strongly since the crisis. For instance, some people have claimed that monetary policy tools aimed at stabilizing macro-aggregates have harmful side effects on specific sectors or types of economic agents. And the allegation that asset purchases increase wealth inequality, that the low-rate environment punishes savers, or that easy monetary policy facilitates the survival of zombie firms are just a few examples. But are we only talking about possible side effects of some measures here? I think these reflections are a broader indication of how heterogeneity can also be a transmission channel for monetary policy. And going one step further, it could appear that monetary policy works more via the cross-section than via the time dimension, which is the traditional New Keynesian intertemporal story. To put it bluntly, could it be that an interest rate cut has a bigger impact on aggregate demand because it shifts income from creditors to debtors who stand ready to spend rather than via intertemporal substitution? Micro-heterogeneity and distributional aspects already appear on the monetary policy stage, and they are backed by advances in theoretical research. Brunner, Meyer, and Sannikov, for instance, 
argue that targeted monetary policy leads to redistributive effects that help mitigate financial frictions. And I think, indeed, credit easing policies are an explicit example of that since specific types of lending are being supported. Newly developed, developed heterogeneous agent new Keynesian models, the so-called Hank models, also help to get essential insight on monetary policy transmission channels when the assumption of representative agents is abandoned. Such models suggest that forward guidance could be less powerful than conventional rate cuts because of liquidity constrained households, for instance. Now, this trend of research would benefit, eh, to come to the topic of this uh, conference, from additional data to help rigorously test these theories also at the euro area level. For sure, extra data at a fairly granular level with a panel dimension to capture effects uh, over time as well are of interest here. Microdata from the Household Finance and Consumption Survey are already a step forward and that effort should be continued. For example, these data have allowed researchers at the ECB to mitigate concerns that the APP benefits the wealthy at the expense of the poor. Other Euro system data initiatives like the one the president mentioned, Anna Credit, uh, also are uh, very useful, for instance, to study the extent of zombie lending and how it interacts with the monetary policy stance. The second challenge is uh, digitalization. Um, and as we all know, dig digitalization of society dramatically changes our lives, eh? how we produce, work, trade, consume. So what are the consequences for monetary policy? I shall mention two interlinked dimensions here. First, digital products and services raise issues with measuring the genuine level of macro aggregates that central banks typically look at. How to adequately capture quantities when, for instance, Netflix or Spotify memberships allow unlimited consumption of content? How do we determine potential output in such economies? And what about measuring consumer prices for digital service providers such as social network platforms? Second, technology ch challenges our understanding of price dynamics. Is price thickness still relevant for digital transactions? How do prices behave when the marginal cost of producing more is very small, even close to zero? Addressing all these questions is no easy task. Overall, uh, digitalization complicates our understanding of the transmission process from extra output to inflation. And this has implications not only for the way we model the economy, and here I'm thinking about possible adjustments to the new Keynesian Phillips curve, but also for the role we devote to monetary policy. Should monetary policy set different objectives if prices are highly flexible and the costs of inefficient price dispersion are much smaller than presumed? Too early to tell, of course, but definitely worth an in-depth investigation. Meanwhile, um, and Turning back to the data uh, issue, I welcome advances made in measuring macroeconomic aggregates in the digital economy, in particular consumer prices. Across the Atlantic, the Billion Prices Project and Adobe Anal Analytics data are promising examples of that. They provide tentative evidence that US inflation could be overestimated, although this result seems to depend on the data set used. At the euro area level, national statistical offices' initiatives on integration of online and scanner prices into HICP measures, as well as the euro system's choice of investing heavily in research on price setting using microdata, will certainly help too. And while digitalization challenges are thinking about macroeconomic accounting, it can also provide a whole new set of granular and at the same time multi-dimensional data. In that sense, big data can become our ally. And I will briefly come back to that point at the end. 
Before that, a word on the third challenge, which is the, cha the changing role of the financial sector. Um, relating to um, the changing nature, I would say, in the role of financial intermediation, well documented in a research area that exploded, I think, during the last decade. We have not only witnessed greater fragmentation within the banking sector, which has forced us to take unprecedented non-conventional measures to preserve a smooth transmission of monetary policy. We are also observing a slow-moving tendency towards a larger role for non-banks in the financing of the economy. With the Capital Markets Union, a project we uh, fully endorse, the role of players outside the traditional banking sector will hopefully get bigger. And this justifies particular vigilance on the part of the ECB to be ready to monitor developments in this area. We should also make sure we are able to monitor developments in so-called private virtual tokens that aim to play a role as money, even though I tend to think that these developments are not or not yet of macroeconomic relevance. And related to this, the fintech revolution blurs the traditional boundaries between the financial and the non-financial sector. When such things are becoming more relevant, monetary policy transmission can profoundly change and monitoring the traditional financial indicators can turn out to be inadequate. Therefore, good data coverage of new trends in the financial sector is essential. And fortunately, again, the Euro system plays a proactive role here, and I would like to give two examples where new data play a key role. During the financial crisis, a Euro system-wide effort was launched to exploit bank-level data underlying the money and credit aggregates that are monitored in the ECB's monetary analysis. And that way, as the President said, the Governor Council could assess in a fairly granular way the transmission of measures via the banking sector. The data also proved key for calibrating the details of the targeted loans we started giving to banks back in 2014. And thanks to money market statistical reporting, which I recognize is a huge statistical challenge, we also have a better view on the workings of euro area money markets. Moreover, it enables the euro system to provide for a backup risk-free benchmark rate should currently available private benchmark rates cease to be published. In this respect, it is very good to see how new economic realities are being reflected here. Contrary to the current benchmarks, transactions with non-bank money market participants could be included in this new benchmark too. So, the three, to conclude, the three challenges I raised today may not only imply extensive use of existing microdata, but also require further efforts to exploit the new world of data opened up by digitalization, the so-called um, big data. I do need do not intend to elaborate much on concrete applications and challenges that come with big data. And these aspects will certainly be more deeply tackled later today in the, in the, in the later session of this conference. But that said, I think uh, technology-driven data brings serious challenges from a practical point of view. Above all, because their granularity is multidimensional. As correctly stated by Andy Haldane from the Bank of England in a speech he gave earlier this year, it runs through their volume, uh, the cross-section dimension, their velocity, the frequency, and their variety. And one needs efficient data analytics tools to use the data properly while being aware of their limitations in terms of privacy and confidentiality. To wrap up, um, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, uh, the challenge in the future will be how, I think, to translate the changes from new data into concrete policy implications. After all, um, the micro evidence has to add up to policy advice for monetary policy, which is a macro policy with a rather limited set of instruments. And therefore, I think that in some cases, other policies, such as macroprudential, fiscal, or structural policies, could be more appropriate for tackling the challenges that new data reveal. I stop there. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Jan. That's a, a very good start for this conference. Uh, and as, as you say, I mean, the, we are confronted always with the speed, you know, of technological changes and the capacity to, to adapt because that requires big investments and uh, big choices in, 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 in budgets, for example. And it's always difficult to say. Think about Anna Credit that you mentioned. It was a big investment. Uh, the return will come over time. Uh, and these are always difficult choices, given the speed also of the technological change. I think it was a very good start. Pablo, uh, many things will come back. Uh, I think one in particular also the measurement of prices more particular. I think Evalti will also deal with the measurement of the price of prices in general, of inflation actually. Thank you, Pablo. You go to the podium. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I promise that I didn't see Jan Smet's presentation before titling mine, <laughs> but uh, as, as Peter said, many topics will, will be recurring here. And during the last years, obviously, we are seeing some challenges from uh, digitalization. There are profound disruptions that we are witnessing and that will continue to be present. Automation, artificial intelligence, and new business models such as the sharing economy, uh, they are starting to shift the way we interact, we trade, we consume and we live in, in general. Uh, it's interesting to note that uh, this is happening not only at the core of the advanced economies, but it's something that is quite prevalent in uh, a number of um, in a number of, of, of economies. Most economies are shifting the boundaries of what here is shown as their level of digital evolution. Uh, this, on the one hand, make the proper measurement of economic and financial phenomena more, more challenging. The traditional framework, as has been pointed out, uh, emphasizes transforming basic inputs into final products by a representative agent, for instance, a firm that delivers a homogeneous good to a household. Uh, however, in the present day, digitalization and financial innovations put into question increasingly the usefulness of this, of this paradigm. The digitalization of economic relationships leading to, well, as I said, the, the sharing economy make, make a clear-cut distinction between producers and consumers harder to pinpoint. The value added of the sharing economy is generated by the match, and therefore we need to distinguish the contribution of both, of both what was traditionally a consumer and the producer in the, in the sharing economy. Also, the diverse way in which individuals and firms can organize themselves into economic activities renders the traditional view of the representative agent a bit more, more obsolete in terms of describing aggregate behavior. Uh, another example is that the bundling of experiences and demands for goods and services, which in the past were provided by well-defined products, today make the identification and measurement of the prices of these goods and services and hence inflation much more, much more difficult. It is amazing how smartphones, for instance, uh, have today bundled a number of products that merely 15 or 10 years ago were provided by very well-defined different, different, different uh, uh, goods. On the other hand, the transition mechanism of monetary policy is also likely to be, to be shifting. There's one key channel of transmission that is through asset prices and credit flows, particularly the exchange rate and cross-border uh, capital flows. It is noteworthy how the globalization process, which began in the, in the early 90s, has resulted in a rapid and unprecedented integration of a disparate set of economies into global finance. Uh, this is likely to continue because the rise of mechanisms to facilitate cross-border lending and skip regulations, such as crypto asset, is likely to make into the future these types of transmission mechanisms stronger and harder to control even by the most determined uh, jurisdictions. The dispersion of economic activities across jurisdictions also highlights the importance that global value chains into global production and the decentralized use of knowledge and intellectual property uh, obtained in a centralized way through R&D. For instance, according to international evidence, with globalization and the development of, of these global value chains, exports are increasingly composed of imported inputs, a phenomenon that is closely linked to, to digitalization, will clearly be pushed forward through the use of blockchain 
in letters of credit, which is in, in an incipient phenomena. And this will obviously, on the point of view from central banks that try to calibrate the transmission mechanism, for instance, of monetary policy to the exchange rate to economic activity through net exports, will need to revisit that, that calibration to take into account these, these, these features. Therefore, digitalization poses significant challenges going forward for the measurement of economic activity, as well as for the transmission of monetary policy. Some of these challenges are very present in the near, near term. Others will be more pressing in the distant future. In any case, monetary policy authorities, particularly those that follow inflation targeting, will need to be cognizant of these developments to understand and calibrate their policies to achieve their, their goals. In terms of the need for granularity or heterogeneity, there are some challenges that need to be undertaken in the most immediate term. And uh, I believe that uh, tackling these will help in the future on the oncoming challenges from digitalization. This relates to the need to increasingly incorporate into the assessment and design of monetary policy the granularity of economic behavior. There are a number of examples, and I want to highlight a few of them. In terms of prices, obviously an adequate response of monetary policy to shocks depends on the proper understanding of price dynamics. Consumer price uh, microdata reveals everywhere, and in particular in Chile, a highly heterogeneous price setting process in the economy. Uh, here, uh, we s I show the case, of, the case of my country, of, of Chile. Uh, in spite of inflation being well anchored in the target, our target is 3%. Average inflation for the past uh, 20 years has been 3.2, quite close to the target. Uh, and we aim to keep it most of the time between 2 and 4%. Interestingly, it has been between 2 and 4%, probably 50% of the time, so almost for most of the time. Uh, but it, it's very volatile. How to understand this volatility and how to see whether it affects or not the achievement of, of uh, our, our target is, is quite, quite the challenge for us uh, going, going forward. In terms of the labor data, um, labor market microdata, it is worth mentioning that measuring labor's contribution to output has become more complex by, by these new developments such as increased labor, uh, labor participation by women, significantly more school years, immigration, self-employment uh, in, into, into services, and also technological advances that are pushing out low-skilled workers, among other phenomena. In this setting, what used to be traditional measures of slack in the labor market, such as the unemployment rate or the employment levels, have lost significant. This has been a feature of the economic landscape in a number of economies after the Great Recession. We need to understand the changing role of the labor market in driving wage and inflationary pressures uh, that should come from the availability of more timely and granular information, encompassing not only demographic and employment characteristics, but also the link to labor market outcomes in terms of, in terms of wages. I have to say that this is obviously important not only for monetary policy, but goes well beyond that in the realm of public policy in general. In terms of financial data, this has also been highlighted. Uh, borrowing structure stands out as other relevant element for monetary policy, under, underscoring the need to close and timely monitoring, monitoring of credit uh, uh, sources. The reliance on average behavior proved woefully in, uh, inadequate in the run-up of the great financial crisis. We will need to be forever cognizant that uh, credit events in very narrow slices of the specific markets, for instance, such as the subprime loan, had eventually systemic implications unexpected uh, for the global financial system. So, so therefore, we should always be uh, aware of the understanding granularity in financial, in financial markets. There has been major advances in the availability of more and better information from the financial sector, but obviously this needs to be uh, pushed even, even further. Identifying the recipients of financing for today's monetary policy requirements is not enough. It is, enough, it is necessary to characterize their behavior, solvency, and vulnerability. For instance, in the face of an economic slowdown, to predict the effect on business spreads, employment, and salaries. A balance sheet approach that highlights the fact that macroeconomic policies adopted in response to shocks may be constrained by domestic balance sheet mismatches. For example, tight monetary policy aimed at preventing an excessive real depreciation may protect balance sheets with large currency mismatches, but create further pressures on balance sheets that have significant maturity mismatches. 
Having this into consideration is important, especially in times of financial stress. A further example of the need for more granular data is on cross-border spillovers of monetary policy. They have been at the center of international policy debates, particularly since the onset of the global crisis. Understanding the channels through which one country's monetary policy affects the international economy is an ongoing research agenda, including spillover via international, uh, active, internationally active banks. And the BIS obviously provides a very good source of information on this area. However, uh, the, the rise of alternative mechanisms for financial intermediation is likely to deepen over time. It can be noted that in those jurisdictions where crypto assets are, have become more popular and where authorities have shown a more restrictive approach to them are also those where overall controls on financial integrations are more acute. This points towards a future where the ability of different jurisdictions to impose controls on cross-border capital flows will be diminished compared to the past, and this will also likely increase the mechanism of transmission of monetary policy through cross-border capital flows. Let me finish with some remarks on the potentials for merging administrative data to improve our understanding of monetary policy. The availability of data for monetary policy conduct could be improved, but simply increasing the volume may not be enough to significantly improve policy effectiveness. Having more information at hand can help make timeliness and timely and appropriate decisions, but only insofar as those responsible for monetary policy are able to correctly analyze and interpret this data. Uh, new data sources open new opportunities, and one particular area where this is true and where countries lag behind their potential is in the availability of high-quality merged administrative data. Due to confidentiality issues, and interdepartmental bureaucracy within different branches of the government, large data sets, often sensual, capturing different aspects of firms and household behavior, remain isolated and of limited use. For instance, and going back to the question of price dynamics at the micro level, tax records may provide very useful information about the behavior of margins at the individual firm level. But this analysis could greatly be advanced by merging tax data with custom information to record cross-border commercial transactions, for instance, to understand the pass-through of exchange rates to, to, uh, 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 to inflation. For the labor market, uh, it's, the same, it's the same thing. Merged data can also be used as a powerful tool to inform monetary policy decisions to the extent that it is available at high frequency. In the case of Chile, there's a good example comes, that comes from a recent law that has required all firms in the economy to conduct all their inter-firm invoicing of value-added tax electronically. This allows the tax office to receive billions of purchase sale invoices between all firms operating the economy every single day. By itself, this data can be treated to provide good real-time proxy of economic activity, since value-added can be extracted directly from every single transaction, and also for inflation, because invoicing records provide both quantities and prices separately. However, Merging this data with additional sources, such as bank records, could be used to provide early warnings about systemic events in some sectors of the economy, since it would include not only the complete network of transactions between firms, but also the exposure of banks and financial institutions to individual firms and or particular industry clusters. Let me close with some uh, remarks, concluding remarks. The use of the representative agent framework for implementing monetary policy and for measuring the microeconomy obviously served well the central banking profession for decades. However, the increased digitalization of economic activities implies that not only the measurement of economic relationships, such as output, inflation, and demand, become significantly more challenging, but the transmission mechanism of monetary policy itself will also likely shift. Central banks need to be cognizant of the difficulties these trends pose for the achievement of their objectives, and they involve short, medium, and long-term challenges for statistics, research, and also model development. In the more immediate future a, future, a fruitful approach stems from the merging of administrative data, and we have, as a central bank that also constructs national accounts, we are heavily invested in that. On the one hand, this will provide an enhanced granularity in assessing economic behavior by heterogeneous agents. On the other hand, the need to understand and process this data by itself is a very good stepping stone for further challenges that will come down the road from big data, big data, and digitalization in general. Uh, statistical agencies and central banks, I believe, 
are adequately placed to preserve the integrity and anonymity of reporting entities, whether they be households, financial, or non-financial corporates. This care for privacy is, however, a topic that in itself will deserve a deeper, a deeper study. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pablo. Also for bringing the international dimension, but also for the rest. But, uh, thank you. Uh, Evan? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear Peter, um, the title of this uh, session is uh, New Data Needs for Monetary Policy. And of course, this title could lead uh, to the temptation uh, to produce now a long wish list uh, and economists, of course, are and should be uh, data-oriented. So it would not be difficult to compile such a long wish list. But the economists are also trained to think in cost-benefit uh, dimensions, to balance uh, merits uh, and costs. And providing new data uh, may involve quite substantial costs, uh, costs for all uh, concerned. And uh, in fact, we are exposed to some criticism in that uh, respect. So I do not intend to talk about, uh, let's say, wish lists, but rather about uh, new perspectives that means not necessarily uh, add-ons, but uh, to talk about new products that may substitute old ones. And to start with a very basic problem, uh, for uh, central bankers, I want to <coughs> make some short remarks on problems of measuring inflation in a globalized world. So we do have, of course, the classical problems of uh, inflation measurements. These are the four biases, uh, product substitution bias, quality change bias, new product bias, outlet substitution bias. And there have been new statistical methods uh, introduced to reduce these uh, biases. So annual updates of consumption baskets. In fact, uh, this is what we do in Austria since 2010. Um, quality adjustment of prices, so the, all this uh, field of hedonic uh, methods, we know quite uh, sometimes not so easy one. Uh, frequent adjustments of the surveyed uh, outlet, uh, <coughs> outlet structures. But there have been two big challenges uh, in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, the effect uh, on the, of the internet on prices and inflation and including the costs of owner-occupied housing in inflation measurement. And I want to make some short remarks on both of these. Uh, with regard to the effect of the internet or in general uh, digitalization, and uh, Jan already uh, dealt with this uh, to some extent, I think it's quite interesting to see this, just this pure, <laughs> again, statistical uh, facts about the substantial increase uh, <coughs> in uh, the use of uh, e-commerce in the euro area. Uh, so the, the uh, uh, red dots are uh, the, uh, uh, the, for 2003, uh, and the uh, uh, blue lines is 2014. So you see, uh, practically everywhere there had been a huge, uh, a huge increase. But what is also interesting is that uh, we do have quite substantial regional uh, differences. So we have uh, uh, very, uh, very high percentages uh, in uh, in Ireland, Luxembourg, Finland and uh, the lower one, uh, Greece, uh, Italy, Latvia. Uh, <clears throat> so this, uh, and uh, you see the same if you have translated uh, into the percentage of individuals uh, ordering goods uh, and uh, services online. Uh, this is, again, has risen uh, substantially, uh, and again, it is different among uh, countries. So the question is, uh, <clears throat> what are the effects of these uh, very substantial changes that we have in, in economic uh, structures? And uh, the question was, would this lead to a tendency uh, that uh, <clears throat> uh, we can have uh, lower prices uh, due to this uh, e-commerce? So it could be because that we have uh, saving costs for wholesalers and retailers, and this might be passed on 
uh, to consumers. <laughs> it might be, <laughs> it might also mean increased profits by some of the agents. Um, or we could have it mean of quite obviously increased competition, transparency. Uh, the question is, is this something that is only temporarily, or is this something that is really a massive uh, structural change? Uh, there is uh, uh, quite a number of uh, evidence and a number of uh, studies uh, on the effects of e-commerce on consumer prices and inflation, but one has to say it is not really conclusive. We have quite different uh, uh, fields, and if I just only uh, <coughs> restrict myself to the latest one, a very uh, uh, so, uh, uh, encompassing study by Cavallo, uh, <coughs> uh, so that there is uh, not really a clear uh, indication that we have differences in online uh, and in offline prices. Uh, so uh, this is kind of an open field, but it may be it may be one of the feels why we have this uh, general topic of uh, persistently uh, low inflation rates. Uh, the <coughs> other topic that is relevant uh, and this is much discussed uh, is uh, the integration of the costs of owner-owned uh, uh, <coughs> occupied uh, housing in the uh, HICP. Uh, and the basic question is, of course, do we see housing as a consumption good? and then included in the HICP uh, as consumption expenses? Or do we see that it's an investment good? And then, of course, it would not I mean uh, to include it. And uh, uh, as you see, we have, according to the legal uh, frameworks that we have, uh, we have uh, uh, in the HSBC, uh, of course, no asset price elements. Um, we separate. Uh, <coughs> Oh, if we have uh, over-occupied house price indices, uh, there we have again some some uh, questions. What does it really mean? <coughs> How to include uh, land uh, land prices? This uh, cl clearly asset prices, uh, which we uh, may have uh, more difficulty to <coughs> to uh, assess. Uh, and uh, we see that we have different approaches uh, in different uh, in different countries. So we do have uh, owner-occupied uh, housing included in the US uh, approach for inflation measurements. For currently, we do not include it in the HICP, uh, but by the end of 2018, the European Commission will assess the suitability of integrating uh, owner-occupied housing in the HICP. And then the question, of course, is, Will this make a substantial difference? And we have tried to look at this uh, <coughs> as far as we can with <coughs> the data we have uh, <coughs> available. And to make a long, <laughs> short story, a long uh, uh, story short, uh, you see the effects. Just if you look also at the euro area, uh, <coughs> are not very dramatic. Uh, so, uh, yes, it is something that, of course, uh, uh, also if we want to compare with the US, so, so might make a difference. It is also not systematically, so it's not that it uh, <coughs> varies, let's say, with the business cycle, but uh, it is a difference. It leads to slightly higher inflation uh, rates, as you see, but not really uh, to a very, very high uh, uh, Amount. So just to give this as two examples, where there is, of course, a clear uh, <coughs> economic policy uh, discussion. If I may uh, turn to a more to the to come back to the beginning and uh, to a more general uh, uh, point. So, uh, is are there uh, new data needs uh, for monetary uh, policy? And if we look at it exclusively for monetary uh, policy. Uh, John Smith showed, um, uh, and also Pablo Garcia, a number of, of course, new questions, new fields, so non-banks, uh, non of course, technical developments with regard to big data and so on. But if I look at, let's say, the banking side as we, as we have it, uh, uh, it may not be the consensus view in this room, but uh, I think, uh, <coughs> I dare to say, that uh, from my point of view, we do not see really a 
great amount of new data needs uh, for uh, monetary policy. Uh, what we see is that we have a rich data stock, which should be exploited first, and we should try to focus on using data for multiple purposes. We have numerous requirements from various business fields, adjust different demands with regard to one and the same data stock. So let's merge these the demands to gain efficiency and save costs. Uh, we see that data requirements have exploded within recent years, and collecting large data sets for one single purpose becomes increasingly hard to justify in the future. So therefore, I think the, the challenge and the perspective uh, should be <clears throat> uh, to harmonize, to cooperation, and uh, what we see, of course, unfortunately, just now is that a large number of international organizations each follow their own agenda. And this, of course, drives up uh, the <coughs> volume of data requests. And we do have, and you see here, uh, some of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of these uh, uh, institutions. So I think there is a large room for improvement here. Uh, we have, uh, therefore, we need more cooperation, more coordination uh, to assure that uh, these international data requirements are harmonized and thus are also limited. Uh, I think it is not the number of data points that is triggering excessive reporting burden, uh, <clears throat> but uncoordinated methodological approaches together with suboptimal operational reporting channels. And I think uh, ECB and EOPA provide a best practice by merging data needs for both monetary policy, the ECB statistics regulation, and supervisory purposes, so Solvency II, in one single requirement, for instance, for insurance uh, cooperation statistics. So therefore, I think and this is uh, <clears throat> to come up with uh, this, uh, of course, the main topic of this uh, conference, I think, uh, concerning granular, granular data. Uh, yes, I think we can use granular data in a cost-efficient uh, uh, way and serve multiple uh, users. Uh, because I think it is <clears throat> very important that uh, they can, can provide a value added for a monetary uh, policy uh, and help, but we have to avoid duplication. So therefore, well-structured, well-structured granular data are an important ingredient for central bank statistics to master upcoming challenges resulting from an increasingly complex and fast-changing global economy. And we have just heard about some examples of these uh, uh, changes. So granular data may, often, uh, may offer more flexibility enable us to calculate any aggregates autonomously for various purposes. So you have one kind of uh, general set for this. And <clears throat> of course, uh, it may also reduce the cost of implementing <clears throat> new statistical uh, requirements uh, in the future. And we have to be aware, uh, <clears throat> reporting burdens, looking at it from the side of a bank, are fixed costs to a large extent. And uh, therefore, of course, they are a relatively heavier burden for small banks than for the big ones. So if we have uh, this discussion on proportionality, I think this is relevant for the statistical side uh, too. And uh, also like uh, President Draghi referred in, into, in his introduction, I think in the US we have perhaps um, achieved a more uh, efficient distribution and, uh, <clears throat> between these uh, uh, <clears throat> various types of banking sizes that, and clearly I think this cost element is something that uh, is, was also the reason why some of the proposals met quite uh, substantial criticism uh, in the financial world <clears throat> in, in Europe. So I think what we have achieved uh, is uh, unaccredited. Unaccredited, I think, has been <clears throat> a big success, or is, uh, has a lot of chances. Uh, it promises, uh, as I have here, uh, <coughs> high return <coughs> on 
on Western because it has a powerful uh, granular data stock. And this uh, allows to tackle uh, a broad spectrum of current and, what is important, future uh, data uh, requirements. Uh, so that means that uh, it will replace inefficient and expensive occasional services dealing with uh, data. Uh, it offers the perspective to harmonize international reporting requirements for loan data, for instance, in the long run, which, and this is a relief then for the reporters. And, of course, it uh, unfolds a long-lasting and steady return of economic insights in the near future on some of these problems that just have been said uh, uh, before. And uh, I want to add, uh, because uh, this uh, symposium uh, today is, I think, the last one that will be chaired by Aurel Schubert as Director General of uh, Statistics. And I would really think it is worth mentioning uh, that um, Anna Credit is one of the big uh, uh, achievements that have been achieved uh, uh, also with your help and under your uh, chairmanship. So I think this is also a good uh, path to mention this. Of course, <clears throat> uh, in, as I said before, in all cases it's about balancing merit and costs. So that means uh, if new data uh, requirements emerge, then, of course, first use existing uh, data sets. Uh, and that means there has to be some degree of flexibility. So I think this is important, otherwise costs will explode. Uh, check uh, <clears throat> uh, if an existing data set can be extended. And thirdly, and only if it is unavoidably considered to set up a new data structure, so to uh, balance merits and uh, costs. I think that uh, the ECB, we have this uh, merit and cost uh, procedure. This is an example for an intelligent and structured uh, framework, which takes uh, account of user needs and balance this against expenditures. But uh, as we all know from our own experience, this is a discussion that has to be t done in any specific case. So this is not a one <laughs> once for all, but we have to do this uh, again and again. And I think we owe this uh, to, <clears throat> let's say, our customers or to the public whom we, uh, whom we have to serve. So therefore, the key, <clears throat> the key messages is that uh, we will uh, have, uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, major uh, <clears throat> challenges uh, in uh, inflation measurements with, uh, due to digitalization, uh, treatment of owner occupied housing. Uh, we have, uh, of course, the effect of uh, e-commerce and so on. Up to now, as we see, uh, perhaps a bit counterintuitively, uh, the effects seem to be not so very uh, substantial. Uh, we should reinforce multi-use of data make increasingly use of what already exists. Uh, I think what is really important is coordination and cooperation between institutions. And uh, of course, uh, <clears throat> that when we talk about uh, uh, data requirements, always balance uh, merits uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, costs. Uh, so I think that, uh, as the president said, this is, uh, we've had 20 years of uh, successful work for ECB statistics, and I'm sure there will be another 20 years of successful work, and I wish all the best for that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Eva. Also on this, this other dimension, merit and cost, which was not in the previous presentation, and I'm sure that will come in the discussion. Natasha, I don't know, what is your take from this? And thank you for having taken that. Uh, sure, I, I don't know if I stand up, but I have a few, sli few slides where I yeah. stay. Yeah, 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 that's fine. So someone might need to, to flip the. So thank you uh, for asking me to step in. So I have the, thank you, Val, the excuse of uh, having known that I would be here since 24 hours about. So you will be, uh, you know, uh, Clément, uh, that's what I'm going to say, but I had the privilege uh, relative to Pablo that I could see all the presentations of each other. So what I decided to do was to make a quick uh, transversal summary of the takeaways I got from your 
speeches and, uh, and, and material. And then I'll pinpoint point two of the examples that some of you mentioned as usefulness of a uh, granularity in data and then uh, a deeper knowledge of, of money markets and the, the, the underlying dynamics in what connects the central banking uh, community with financial intermediaries as a whole. Uh, before making the summary of what you all said, I wanted to recall that there was a time, which is not so long ago, I think all the economists that were trained from my generation, so I'm not the youngest one, but not the oldest one either, uh, where when you were studying monetary economics, you were basically told that with GDP, CPI, and the interest rate, you could go a very long way into understanding how the transmission mechanism for monetary policy was working. And so those were the good old days, or the bad old days, and, and I think the whole discussion is about what have we gained and what are we gaining relative to those, uh, to those approaches, we, which were complemented by approaches or approximations of monetary policy preferences uh, by loss functions and tailor, tailor rules, and tailor rules have been the game in town for central bankers for a long time, even still now to some extent. So now, and this is what you collectively said, the economy is changing the structure of the economy, is changing the context in which monetary policy is conducted, is changing as well. The policy tools have uh, evolved. Uh, the scope of monetary policy, to, to a large extent, has evolved, at least in advanced economies. I mean, in, in emerging economies, and I think Pablo's remarks were very complementary to what, what has been said by uh, Jan and Eval, but I think in, in, in advanced economies, we moved into a new world with new, with new tools and a combination of tools that yields uh, new results. Uh, and then the third point is that technology will not wait, and it will and it should help uh, central, banker, central bankers as any other policymaker and any other economic agent through IT improvements, through artificial, artificial intelligence, and through the availability of data. And this is something which I think the central banking community seems to be aware and really up and running on those, on those advances. Uh, you know, as opposed to, the, to what sometimes is the you know, public perception of, of, of public sector entities. I think central bankers are, in, uh, bankers are leading here. So I thought your views along those lines were fairly converging and complementary. Some of you uh, put more emphasis on some uh, dimensions. One key area for monetary policy that comes out of everything you said is inflation. So Eval spoke more than the others on inflation, but the measure of inflation <coughs> is, uh, is at stake. Uh, we need to, and we, perhaps we can better than before, follow the data generating process behind price developments more accurately, but the DGP has also likely, very likely changed. That's what Jan said and, and Evald said. Uh, digitalization happened. Uh, the basket has changed. The, the example of owner-occupied housing is a very good case at point. I come back to it later. It's, it, um, to me, it exemplifies the categorization into consumer goods, you know, uh, durable goods, and capital goods. Those categories have changed for the mere fact that Pablo was underlying, which is the sharing economy is, is coming up, and the intensity of use of what used to be considered as capital is changing the nature of capital. I have a car. If I have a car and it, I let it sit when I don't use it, it's a durable good. Now, if I use a car and you're using it 10 minutes after me, and this is a 24 hours process of using the car, the car is becoming something else uh, than, than a capital goods or a durable goods. So this has to be taken into account in price dynamics. And I think it, it points also to something that Evald was mentioning in terms of legal constraints on the definition of uh, CPI, which I'm not familiar with. But the fact that we cannot in, in include asset prices in CPI, is it something of the past? Do we still, do we want to conform our measurements to legal frameworks that might need some, uh, some amendment? So I leave that open for the discussion, but I think the question was, uh, was interesting to ask. Now, so as a result of all those changes in the DGP, the value chains are changing, the value added is captured differently. And so you asked the question, rightly so, what is the impact on final prices? We should expect a decline in price dynamics or a slowdown in price dynamics. But the fact is, when you ask firms, and I've had the chance to look at this from inside firms before, uh, they see their own share of value added being eroded. 
Uh, but this value is captured by actors that have, are acting in a monopolistic context. And this market structure, as long as it lasts, will probably prevent price dynamics from reflecting you know, technological changes and improvements in the productivity that should lead, uh, you know, otherwise lead to, to, to more muted price dynamics. You may say it's a good thing for central bankers today who are, you know, looking for inflation, but this is something to be taken into account, this, 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 this market structure argument. Uh, right, so that was, that was the, the point. Then there was, and that's my last uh, summary of what you said, uh, you had points about methods and you know, best practices, the way data collection uh, needs to be conducted. I'm not an expert at all here, but I think the general message is uh, a best practice principle for data collection is being parsimonious and to consolidate as much as possible data requirements. And now that we've had really a huge injection of you know, needs for our regulatory purposes, it would be very difficult indeed for actors who have, to, have had to swallow those data reporting, new data reporting requirements, uh, to have, you know, even more data reporting requirements for monetary policy purposes. So, given those constraints, the ideal world for data scientists and economists would be taking the existing stock of data as it is, and here uh, I come back to what, what Evald was saying in terms of cost efficiency and not, willing to, you know, not being willing to renew uh, data sets every, every other day, uh, what is badly needed now uh, is the ability to merge and to match data sets. I think a, a, a huge work, and I know a lot of work is being done for this in terms of you know, matching identifiers, making databases speak to each other. I think here there are, there are huge efficiency gains uh, that can be made for the end user of statistics. Now, uh, granular data has been a very common uh, topic to you all. It has lots of advantages. You've highlighted that the in terms of quality, flexibility, fungibility, comes back to the matching data sets argument. Um, but it, it's, it also matters for addressing a new set of economic issues in, which include heterogeneity and distribution. And as far as monetary policy has an impact on distribution and relies on heterogeneous uh, transmission channels, this brings in new information that we were not able to address with the triptych, you know, CPI, GDP, and interest rates. So, you know, I give the answer a bit, but this is also something for, for discussion. Um, now, between granularity and aggregate macro data, there we, we might be, you know, it's a bit of a balancier. We are so happy to be able to have those granular data that we want to have the most of it. Now, we shouldn't forget that maybe the sum is sometimes different from, you know, the total, different from the sum of the parts. And so we need probably to keep both approaches uh, to have a comprehensive and a holistic view, like, like a, a, a good view about uh, the transmission of monetary policy, but also economic structures. Now, uh, I have a wish list because I surveyed yesterday the staff who's doing monetary policy here, and I had you know, mails coming back with you know, very granular lists of we need this monthly, we need this in terms of stocks and flows. So I won't read that all. I haven't put that all on the slides, but this you know, wish list is, is out there, and, and, and there's a, it's a kind of shopping list through which I think it's worth, it's worth uh, going. I summarized it in four points having a full cross-country matrix, and I completely agree with that. Any kind of network analysis or general equilibrium analysis will only be possible when we have bilateral flow data of any sort. I mean, I, for, for my own research, I use it for international capital flows, but that is true very generally, as soon as you have to do with a network, and the financial system is a network. Um, the question of gross flows and redemptions, so having, having clean uh, net measures, uh, more granular data on the OFI sector, so of the non-bank sector, uh, and multinationals need to be singled out more in national statistics. This is also fairly uh, broad-based. Now, uh, I have more of it, lots of praise of an, an accredit, so really an accredit, if there's one thing to be underlined in terms of usefulness of the investments that have been made, it is that one. It was the rant of some economists who were able to approximate it, so, but now that it will be uh, available to everyone, it will really create uh, a lot of research and hopefully good research on it. Um, 
uh, last, the last point of this slide, exposure to crypto assets. Uh, someone mentioned it, and I think maybe we should keep, keep an eye on it, uh, not because it's very small, but, but because in terms of you know, the link between monetary policy and financial stability uh, lies with crypto assets very deep and deeply rooted, close to the meaning of money. I don't want to expand on that, but this is something fairly, fairly key. I just want to add something that was uh, uh, brought to my, uh, uh, mind by, by Pablo, I think. Um, in the euro area, as opposed to other countries, and probably also as opposed to the US, we tend to discard for monetary purposes the international for monetary purposes, we, I'm not saying we're not looking at that, but the international spillovers of our policies. A lot of people look at it in, in this house, but for monetary policy purposes, you know, using the international role of the euro in, in, you know, as a reserve currency, as a trading currency, using you know, all those dimensions that have an impact on how our monetary policy transmits into, first, for example, into foreign exchange markets. Now, sometimes we don't understand whether the euro goes up because of you know, current account imbalances or because of the you know, uncovered interest rate parity. Sometimes it switches. And behind this, there's a logic that we might fail to capture because we don't pay enough attention to this international dimension that emerging economies have had to pay attention to in order, in order to survive as currencies, uh, as currency issuers. So I think that it's worth uh, highlighting this. I close with two, two, two charts. Uh, one uh, which is uh, uh, an example of why granularity matters and what can be used, uh, how we can use granular data without, without any you know, modeling effort and what kind of messages we can get here. You have a picture of the evolution of credit and investments by non-financial corporations. This is made on Italy because it was a pre and a credit world, <laughs> but uh, using the granular data we had for, for Italy or the, 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 the authors had for Italy, they looked at the, the, the evolution of credit supply to NFCs and investment made by, by those non-financial corporations in growth rates relative to 2006. They split the sample into two subgroups and this, the splitting of the sample was made according to the way their banks were funding them, themselves. So I'm looking here at the transmission mechanism of monetary policy without causality. It's just you know, a visualization of data. But the red uh, firms are the ones that are getting liquidity or getting credit from banks that rely a lot on interbank funding. And the blue ones are the ones that relied on banks that do not rely so much on interbank funding. So it tells you a bit, you know, the link between f money market structure and the transmission from money market to infinite to investment dynamics. And the right-hand side chart is basically telling you that those who were exposed indirectly to a lot of, of interbank funding in those years were the, one, the ones where investment collapsed the most, and even more so than the credit constraint as it appeared on the, on, on the right hand side, would suggest. I skip my last slide, Peter, because I feel I have. Uh, thank you. The, these are enough. very, thank you, Natasha, very pertinent points. Um, we have about 25 minutes. Just, just quick comments also to the discussant, if I may, Natasha. Uh, the good old days, of course, these were the days where we had uh, imbalances were building up. And we were looking at imbalances in the labor market, but the imbalances were in the financial market. So, and the data, of course, we didn't have all the data that we would have wished, but it was more the attention. It was not only a problem of uh, lacking data about interconnectedness, but also just uh, sort of uh, focus how you see the world. And uh, so that's uh, just a caveat when you say we lack of data, but it's also the attention to the right problems, not always easy to do. The second, it didn't really come in the discussion directly, it's indirectly in. It is the, uh, when what we, we use, uh, output gap, potential growth, productivity. I mean, if you ask me where, I mean, I was asked by, I think, Bloomberg or one of these, uh, what will be the, the, the biggest mistakes, you know, uh, that we are making today and that we will discover 10 years from now, I say probably the growth of productivity because we have 
little clue. Now, of course, we have a GDP, nominal, and then you have both, the real and the nominal and, and the price side. And probably there, you, we don't know yet, but we know there are big measurement problems there. And that may feed into you know, um, our policy, of course. We don't know yet today, but that's a, that's a key challenge. And the, the last little point I have, well, if I may, a little point, is the, which was not mentioned, and that's where we have this ambition to do, which costs money, Evald. It's uh, what the New York Fed actually is doing, is looking at publics, the public, the general public, perceptions on inflation and on monetary policy. It's not only because we have some information on markets, you know, via market prices, but also service among market participants. But from the general public point of view, we have no clue. We have some service about, do you think price is going to rise fast or not faster? We have the Michigan and the US, these sort of things. But uh, I think we should also look more about the public perceptions about uh, monetary policy. And the, the very, very last is also on, on wages, of course, which didn't come very much. It came incidentally. Uh, oh, but you, you mentioned it also, Pablo. But that's, that's also something we have uh, big, uh, well, big data on that. Uh, but we need much more, given what you said, actually, Pablo. You, you mentioned that actually. Maybe I ask a very, very quick reactions if you have on the on the interventions, Pablo. Maybe if there are none, there are none, and then we open. Yes, very short. If it's very short, it's fine. So I give a chance for the the audience then to react. So yes, uh, Pablo, um, Jan, Evald. I think the discussion we, we will observe and we will yeah. see. Yeah, very, very quickly. I, I, I found the, the, the other presentations very stimulating and, and Natasha's comments also very, very to the point. Uh, one, one thing that I, I would like to highlight is that the distinction in this dimension between advanced and emerging economies is shrinking and it will continue to shrink really fast. Uh, one example is that in, in an emerging economy where you have a weaker statistical base, there are very strong local demands for data. Uh, societies are heterogeneous, and um, there are complaints from, from marginalized groups or, or faraway places that they would like to get a better, better statistical representation. Uh, of course, that would become extremely expensive. One example is Colombia, with their, their, their aim at targeting social programs after the peace process. Uh, how to do that? Uh, well, they found out that the very good proxy for local GDP was the density of cell phone communication networks. So that you can get that every 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, another example is, is uh, in the case of Chile, uh, the, the, labor, the, the self employment is a very good buffer in times of, of weak economic activity. But, and we've seen that the amount of Uber and Cabify drivers today is about the same magnitude of the increase in self employment. So these are these are the, the ones, a few ways in which in which this this digitalization is is changing the nature of of of, of the need for macroeconomic statistics, and and finally on the on the merging, I think that is very very clear that it's ex, it's expensive to have new statistics and the merging of already existing administrative data is a is a, at least we see it as a as a very good venue to particularly uh, ease the burden of reporting, which is kind of an issue. Yes. Yes, yes, if you allow me, uh, two comments, one of the, on the cost efficiency and one on the impact of e-commerce. On the cost efficiency, absolutely, uh, I absolutely agree. Uh, cost efficiency is, is, is of great importance, no duplication, coordination, merge, merge of, uh, of statistics. But in terms of cost-benefit uh, cost, uh, analysis, the benefit, um, uh, we have to keep at uh, all costs, I would say in all prices, is uh, to keep trust in our policies and in, uh, of people in what we are doing. Um, and so there are two things which are key, our objective, which is an in inflation figure, and our transmission process. And so we have to be sure that we, are, we, we can maintain a, 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 an excellent measurement of our inflation objective. So it probably needs with e coms going up that we indeed uh, are adjusting our methods. And in terms of transmission process, um, if it is true that this direct, let's say, intertemporal substitution mechanism is, let's say, losing weight in favor of, let's say, a response which is more uh, moving to, uh, uh, through general equilibrium mechanisms, if we know that um, our, our, uh, the measures we have taken have very, may have very divergent impacts because we know that a fraction of households have zero or little wealth and uh, or, or very little uh, very, very, uh, 
weakly responsive to interest rate uh, movements. If we know that wealthy people, instead of consuming more, if we are lowering interest rates, are rebalancing their portfolios towards uh, other assets, if we know that there are fixed and uh, adjustable mortgage rates across the euro area, I think we should uh, we should try to, to, to see that reality more. And it, it is it's really needing more granular uh, data in order to keep confidence, I think, in what we are doing. Second remark on the e-commerce. It's uh, three quick remarks. One, it's true. It will, um, it will have a downward on, on imp of, uh, impact on prices, more transparency, also um, the impact of technology on other factors of uh, production um, will, uh, will reduce prices and costs and think of robots competing with workers and so having downward impacts on wages. Okay. Secondly, is this temporary or permanent? I think a large fraction may be temporary because there is no reason to think that the fusion of e-commerce uh, at, at, at a certain point of time will not stabilize. So it will be something more in terms of relative price levels. And by the way, monetary policy always can, uh, can uh, make sure that, let's say, also that the impact of these relative price adjustments is uh, mitigated uh, through, our, uh, through our monetary policies. And, and we are, have all, always the, uh, let's say, the instrument, uh, uh, the policies needed um, need, uh, in order to make sure that the increased potential created by the digital is fully exploited. But the third and last remark is that uh, there may be also an impact on the natural interest rate eh, of digital and technology. So uh, it may be upward because it's raising potential growth, but it may also be downward because the demand of capital investment goes down. That was an argument which uh, Larry Summers developed, I think, some times ago, because you see that uh, firms like WhatsApp, they have a market value uh, away uh, above uh, uh, many other firms with very, very low capital investment. And that's uh, on itself very challenging for monetary policy, given the zero lower band. So we should then, if that is true, reflect also, I think, about, uh, about our inflation objective. Thank you. Yeah, very briefly, <clears throat> just I think that this uh, follows of, uh, quite a number of issues. I think, uh, and I think this is a chance also of this conference, uh, it's not just about uh, <laughs> get, getting numbers. I think uh, it's getting numbers to, to, the, to the relevant questions. And therefore, I think the cooperation between economic theory and statistical approaches is extremely important. And one, one field where this is uh, uh, quite obvious and has been visible is, for instance, labor markets. Because uh, uh, many of us uh, have been astonished, so there was always the expectation, uh, well, as you know, the, or the whole Phillips curve discussion and so on. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and so, but in labor, in labor econo economics, things have been much more advanced. They knew that this is that you have uh, a quite uh, <clears throat> different uh, uh, relationships. And I have to say, if I remember <laughs> the discussions, and you have been there also at the BIS, when our American friends uh, spoke, uh, most of their time was about labor markets. Uh, but uh, from the point of view of labor economics, which proved to be relevant. And then you know what are the questions that you have to ask for the statistics. So I think this is to have this. Uh, if you allow me one short point. Yeah. This was not the confidential information, what they saying. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about labor market. Yeah. I hope it is not yeah. too disturbing the markets. <laughs> so, uh, uh, one, one, uh, one aspect that I really wanted to, uh, I didn't want to include this in the written uh, uh, part. This is trust in statistics. And this is especially important because in the time of globalization, we have to deal with international aspects. I have been recently been in China. I have had a talk with the IMF uh, representative in China <laughs> about his view on, uh, on Chinese statistics. Uh, I only say uh, we talked about it. I don't <laughs> comment more of this. But we have this also, we have still have some problems also over in Europe. And uh, I want to finish with uh, reminding you 
and I think this is for the statistics community still an open sore, uh, that we have this case in Greece where the chief uh, statistician uh, still, still uh, has uh, criminal trials. And I think uh, this is uh, really perhaps much more important uh, to, to mention than many kind of uh, technological or technical changes. This is basic. And I think this is something where we should uh, re uh, re remind again and again an independent uh, work of statistics is essential also for, the, for statistics being meaningful. No, I, th I think uh, <coughs> you're right, Eva. That was very important to say. Um, open the floor. About 20 minutes, yeah, Luis, yeah. 